Pick up on page 209. <clears throat> the Sorting Hat finished its song and everything, and Harry and Ron are talking about what the Sorting Hat meant. And Nearly Headless Nick goes on and talks about how the Sorting Hat will add to the song if it feels that there's particular need and such. And Harry says, and it wants all the houses to be friends. And he looks over at the Slytherin table where there's Draco Malfoy. Fat chance. Notice, Harry is the one to say, no way, not going to be friends. Okay. Nick, well, now you shouldn't take that attitude. We ghosts, you know, peaceful cooperation. Though we belong to separate houses, we ghosts maintain links of friendship. In spite of the competitiveness between Gryffindor and Slytherin, I would never dream of seeking an argument with the Bloody Baron. And Ron says, only because you're afraid of him. No, think about this. Why does a ghost have anything to be afraid of? I mean, what can you really do? Can you kill him again? Okay. And so Nick goes off, and then Umbridge... Uh, interrupts Dumbledore and Hermione has to explain to Harry and Ron bottom of 214 that she paid attention to what Umbridge said and what it means is that the Ministry of Magic is interfering at Hogwarts They're, they've now got a spy on the inside keeping an eye on things Okay, Harry goes up to his dorm room that evening and what do we see happen? It's the first time we see anything like this. One of his roommates no longer gets along with him. Seamus Finnegan. We find out Seamus Finnegan's mom takes the Daily Prophet. She reads it. Harry and Seamus have this big fight. Okay. What did Dumbledore say at the, at the end of book four about Voldemort? What was one of his per particular strengths? Sowing discord. And then we heard the sorting hat, as I put on the board the other day, talk about discord crept in. And we talked about how discord means, you know, broken heartedness. Well, what happens upstairs in that bedroom? <clears throat> the, the unity that had been there is now destroyed. Okay? So we go on to chapter 12. And we're going to skip a bunch. I want to try and get as much through here as I can today. Uh, they go on to Snape's class and everything, and then they go to Defense Against the Dark Arts with Umbridge. And she writes up on the board, you know, Defense Against the Dark Arts, Return to Basic Principles on page 239. And then she tells them what her course aims are. Why? Because... Every, every school of education, every department of education, tells you that every syllabus ought to have what the course aims or objectives are. If you'll look at mine carefully, it doesn't, simply because I like to be contrarian. Um, <clears throat> They'll tell you that you ought to tell your students what it is they're supposed to get out of it. Okay? And so she tells us what her course aims are. Understanding the principles underlying defensive magic. Okay? Learning to recognize situations in which defensive magic can legally be used. And placing the use of defensive magic in a context for practical use. Now, notice Hermione immediately sees what's the problem with these course aims. No using wands. In other words, no practical defense, defensive magic. So Hermione's like, well, what's the point? Because what is Umbridge going to teach? Theory. Theory as opposed to? Reality. Reality. The real world. She's going to teach the theory of magic. This would be like taking a driver's ed course and learning about the theory of driving a car. 
how you theoretically sit in the car and turn the key. Even better, let's say, the theory of driving a stick shift, a manual transmission. So you theoretically get in the car and you put your left foot on the clutch and your right foot on the gas, and you just let the left foot out and the, push the right foot in just enough until they engage, and you drive smoothly down the road. And you go from theory to the driver's ed test without ever having practiced. Mm -mm. Okay? And if you do it where I did it, where we had to do it on hills, and we had to park uphill and downhill, you know, to make sure wheels were turned properly so that you're not, you know, having a car roll down the hill and all that kind of stuff. So what does this tell us about Umbridge? And what might J.K. Rowling be suggesting through Umbridge? What does she say to Hermione when Hermione starts asking all kinds of questions? Okay, why would you need that? What else does she say? Are you a ministry trained wizard? She asks. Are you an expert in educational principles? Well, is Umbridge? <laughs> no. But she's appointed by the ministry, okay? So she essentially says, what do you know, little girl? Be quiet. Sit down. Shut up. Don't ask questions. Okay? And there are, and you've probably had some, there are a lot of teachers who like those kinds of students. Don't ask questions. Just be quiet. Just take notes. Soak it all in. You know, kind of a thing. All right? I think Rowling might be suggesting... This isn't such a great educational model. That education needs to have some practical aspects to it. So when Hermione says 242, well, surely the whole point of defense against the dark arts is to practice defensive spells. Are you a ministry trained educational expert, Miss Granger? No, well, then you are not qualified to decide what the whole point of any class is. Okay. In other words, you don't have a right to an opinion here. So she goes on and talks about page 243 at the bottom. The ministry thinks that all you need is a theoretical knowledge to get you through your examination. Now, what does the examination include? Theory and practice. Okay. So Harry has to stand up for the truth. And he eventually tells Umbridge to shut up. So he has a little note he has to take to McGonagall. And page 248, McGonagall tells him, Potter, you need to be careful. He's like, why? Misbehavior in Dolores Umbridge's class could cause you much more than house points and a detention. What do you... Potter... Use your common sense. What's Harry thinking? Oh, house points, detention. Ooh. You know who she is. You know who she works for. Harry's like, uh, yeah, <laughs> kind of slow. But I was telling the truth. Okay. Notice what world Harry is inhabiting when he says that. The world of theory. But it's the truth. The truth should always win out. The truth should always be... No. And McGonagall has to say, Harry, come back down to my world. <laughs> come back down to the real world. For heaven's sake, Potter, do you really think this is about truth or lies? It's about keeping your head down and your temper under control. In other words... Learn self-control, Harry. And she gives him another biscuit and stuff. And then she says, didn't you listen to Umbridge's speech? Harry, well, no, but Hermione did. <laughs> All right. So we get detention with Dolores, that chapter. Uh, I'm going to skip a whole bunch again. 
And they go off to Grubbly Plank's class. And here he goes to detention with Dolores. And he asks her if he could get out of detention because he's on the Quidditch team. And she says no. And so what does she have him do? You guys probably didn't have to do these in grade school. He has to write lines. My sister posted something on Facebook the other day. <clears throat> Looks like this. It has these little metal things like that. And it would hold five of them that you could then stick chalk in. Okay. And I said, you know, I used to use that to cheat when I had to write lines because I had to write lines all the time. When I was in grade school, you know, I will not talk in class or I will not, you know, whatever. And so I would take this and, you know, if I had to write 500 lines, which I had to do a few times, you know, you do five of those so you only have to write 100 lines kind of a thing. Unfortunately, Harry doesn't have to do that because what kind of lines does Harry have to write? I must not tell lies. And so he pulls out the quill that she gives him, puts it down on the parchment, and sees what happens. Does he stop? Does he say, oh, this hurts, you know, you're mean, I'm gonna go see, you know. No, what does he do? I'm not gonna give her the satisfaction. He toughs it out, okay? Darkness comes, he spends several hours. She looks at his hand and she goes, oh, not enough, guess you'll have to come back tomorrow. He thought he had detention for how long? A week. So he goes off. Ron asks, how is detention? Harry lines. Oh, Ron, that's not too bad. Harry, no, not really. <laughs> Notice he doesn't go, what do you mean not too bad? All right. So he goes back. And the next night, and he writes lines again, and it shows up much better. And Umbridge says, yeah, you still have to come back the next night. Okay. And page 272, um, Ron sees Harry's hand, says, what is that? Harry says, oh, nothing. And then Ron says, I thought you said she was giving you lines. Harry was like, yeah, and tells the truth. The old hag? She's sick. Go to McGonagall. Harry, no, not giving her the satisfaction of knowing she's got to me. I'm not going to let her know. Okay? And Harry says, you know, besides, Dumbledore's got too much on his mind. Is that really the reason why Harry doesn't want to go to Dumbledore? So why doesn't he want to go to Dumbledore? He doesn't trust him. There's something's happened, but Harry doesn't understand what. Okay. So he goes back, he does it again, does the lines again, and she says, I think I've made my point. You may go. And notice he doesn't have to come back. And he goes, and Hermione gives him the whatever this stuff is essence of murlap or something. Okay, and then we get Percy and Padfoot. Harry gets a letter from Sirius, uh, or sends a letter to Sirius. Okay, I'm going to skip a bunch. Runs into Cho, and page 287. Okay, now remember when Harry left home and went to Grimmauld Place? What um, Moody said about why he had to be disillusioned? Because Sturgis Podmore has his spare invisibility cloak. And he says, besides, an invisibility cloak wouldn't stay on you while flying, so I'm going to disillusion you. But he mentions Podmore still has his disability cloak. And then we read on 287, Trespass at the Ministry. Sturgis Podmore, da-da-da-da-da, trespassed at the ministry and has been given six months in Azkaban. Ron, wait a second. He's one of the, shh. 
six months in Azkaban for trying to get through a door? <coughs> okay. <coughs> and so Ron thinks, hmm, was he on working for the order? They don't know yet. So they continue talking. And I'm going to skip a bunch. And here he gets a, excuse me, Ron gets a letter from Percy. Page 296. Dear Ron, I've only just heard from no less a person than the Minister of Magic himself, who has it from your new teacher, Professor Umbridge, that you have become a Hogwarts prefect. Notice he doesn't hear it from his mother. He doesn't hear it from Ron. He doesn't hear it from any of his brothers because nobody's talking to him. I was most pleasantly surprised when I heard this news and must firstly offer my congratulations. I must admit I've always been afraid that you would take what we might call the Fred and George route. In other words, he might actually amount to something. He might be fun, okay? Rather than following in my footsteps. So you can imagine my feelings on hearing you've stopped flouting authority and decided to shoulder some real responsibility, okay? But I want to give you more than congratulations, Ron. I want to give you some advice. Now, notice, what kind of advice is this? Okay, what else? More or less from the ministry through Percy. Okay, from the ministry through Percy. What else? What kind of advice do you appreciate? If you appreciate advice. Aren't there really two kinds? There's sought after advice. And then there's free advice. Sought after is advice that you go to somebody and seek. Why do you go to that person and seek advice? Because you respect them. I mean, what does the word advice mean? It comes from ad visio, to see. It means the person you're seeking advice from can see. They can see maybe better than you, more clearly than you. Okay? So you go to somebody who's maybe experienced some things that you think would be beneficial to you to know and understand. What about the other kind of advice? Somebody just walks up to you out of the blue and starts giving you advice. Is it going to be as beneficial? Is it going to be as respected? No, because free advice is usually worth what you pay for it. So what's Percy doing here? Oh, Ronald, listen to me, your older, wiser brother who now has a plush job at the ministry. He's being it. you know what? <laughs> I won't use the word. He's being a prat, as they would say, or a git. Okay? Offering advice where none is sought. So, from something the minister let slip and telling me you were now a prefect, I gather you're still seeing a lot of Harry Potter. I must tell you, Ron, nothing could put you in danger of losing your badge more than continued fraternization with that boy. Why does he use the word fraternization? Usually used with the enemy. Yeah, because you don't fraternize with the enemy. That's the context. All right? Yes, I'm sure you're surprised to hear this. No doubt you will say that Potter has always been Dumbledore's favorite. Is that why Ron's surprised to hear this? What did Percy say when Harry was sorted into Gryffindor? We got Potter. We got It was Percy that said that. It wasn't Fred and George. Okay. We got Potter. It's Percy all along who's, you know, yay, Harry. Until now. But I feel bound to tell you Dumbledore may not be in charge at Hogwarts much longer. So what should Ron take from that? Warning bells. And the people who count have a very different and probably more accurate view of Potter's behavior. Well, who are the people who count? The ministry? The daily prophet? 
Percy. I shall say no more here, but if you look at the Daily Prophet tomorrow, you get a good idea of the way the wind is blowing and see if you can spot yours truly. In other words, even Percy gets a little quote. Seriously, you do not want to be tarred with the same brush as Potter. Could be very damaging to your future prospects. Notice what Percy thinks about the future. Problem is, what is the future? No one really knows. Because what literally is the future? It's not. There is no future. There's now and there's yesterday. Because lo and behold, what could happen? Even as I am speaking, we could have one of those, you know, unknown thousands of asteroids that are out there, you know, Murfreesboro and Peck Hall, gone. You know, if the asteroid that blew up over Chelyabinsk, Russia, back in February was just a little bit bigger, Chelyabinsk, Russia, Russia could have been poof. <laughs> and rather than having, you know, a thousand injuries and a bunch of windows blown out, there would have been a thousand deaths. Okay? All because they didn't know this big old rock the size of a school bus was hurtling towards Earth. Just the other day, in case you're interested in, you know, impending doom, just the other day, four asteroids whizzed by Earth, not nearly as close as that one, but within a distance of some of them from about, I think it was 300,000 miles to 23,000 miles, 23 million miles. None of them had been seen prior to whoop, going by. Get you to think about the real things like yeah, Keegan. It's supposed to be one of them that hits in like 2020. They're already tracking. Yeah, I mean there are there are a few kind of like that. You know, hopefully they'll come up with some idea between now and then of what to do. Hopefully they don't just you know shoot a oh my yeah a bullet or something at it, make it fragment into a bunch of pieces, and then have a whole bunch of problems. Okay, so. You must be aware, given that our father escorted him to court, Potter had a disciplinary hearing. And what happened? He got off on a mere technicality. Well, really, what was that mere technicality that Harry got off on? He was pretending. He was innocent? <laughs> That's a mere technicality in Percy's book. He was innocent. He had a witness. Okay? Or you could say, what's the mere technicality? Dumbledore showed up to save his bacon yet again. It may be you're afraid to sever ties with Potter. I know, he can be unbalanced and all. Really? His, from what we've seen so far, who's, who's more unbalanced, Ron or Harry? Ron. What's Ron's middle name? Anybody remember? Bilious. Comes from the word bile. Bile is one of the four humors from the Middle Ages. Humors are, are, are these kind of um, I don't want to say spirit, because spirit has demonic, <coughs> spirits is the best word. One of these four spirits that people have in their body, and you've got four of them, and how they're mixed determines what kind of character you have. And bile was the humor that determined anger and rash action. Well, think of Ron. What is he doing well, book four, come on, Harry, you could tell me how you got your name. And, oh, you're not going to tell me? Fine, screw you, you know, I'm not your friend anymore. Until he sees Harry's, you know, possibly going to die. So, what does he say? If you have any fears, speak to Dolores Umbridge, a really delightful woman. Okay. And Ron's looking at Harry's hand. A really delightful woman who just happens to be sick and twisted. <laughs> this leads me to my other bit of advice. Dumbledore's regime at Hogwarts may soon be over. Your loyalty, Ron, should not be to him, but to the school and the ministry. Very sorry to hear that so far Umbridge is encountering very little cooperation from staff. 
Should should Percy really have said that? Because what has he just told Ron? That no, no, one likes her. no one likes her. She's a loner. Okay. So a student willing to help Professor Umbridge now may be very well placed for head boyship in a couple of years. Ooh, golly gee, even I, Ronald Weasley, can be head boy. Notice what that tells us about Percy, Percy, but not about Ron. What's Percy see as the path to power? Prestige, position. You think Ron cares anything about being head boy? No, not at all. What's Ron care for? Sticking with his friends. Making a name for himself. Not becoming head boy, okay? What have we already seen? What does he see when he looks into the mirror? He wants to see himself different from his brother. Different from his brother. Quidditch captain, holding the house cup. He did see himself as head boy too, okay? So, um, he mentioned Sturgis Podmore, friend of Dumbledore's, now at Azkaban. Maybe that'll open your eyes and our parents' eyes as to... You know, what happens to Friends of Dumbledore? And so what, is, what does Ron do with this wonderful bit of advice? Rips it up and throws it out the window. Okay? Or throws it in the fire. And then they see Sirius's head in the fire. And they talk to Sirius about Umbridge. And he says, I don't think she's a Death Eater. Page 302. Harry, she's foul enough to be one. So notice that. She's foul enough to be a Death Eater. Percy, uh, excuse me, serious. Yes, but the world isn't split into good people and Death Eaters. So what does he mean by that? <clears throat> exactly. Not all bad people are Death Eaters. You have good people and bad people, and then you have Death Eaters. So you can have all kinds of really rotten SOBs, but they're not Death Eaters. It takes a certain category to be a Death Eater, all right? Um, they keep talking, and Sirius has to go. He says, you know, don't ask too many questions about Hagrid. He's on business and he says um try and see me you know the next hogs meet and harry's like no 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 okay next chapter the hogwarts high inquisitor why does rowling name her the high inquisitor what does she want her audience to think of inquisition. say it again the, inquisition. the spanish inquisition which was known for not being very nice you know, invention of the rack, varieties of kinds of torture. So what do we see? The ministry seeks educational reform. Dolores Umbridge appointed first ever High Inquisitor. From what action or statement does this flow? Anybody remember? When Dumbledore told Fudge at Harry's hearing that, well, since the ministry doesn't have any say of what goes on at Hogwarts, and Fudge goes, oh, don't we? Well, let's see about that. Okay. In a surprise move last night, the Ministry of Magic passed new legislation giving itself an unprecedented level of control at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Okay. And Percy is quoted. So he's now responding to concerns voiced by anxious parents. Notice, why is the ministry taking control? So we, we hear the same reason given whenever somebody wants to take away a freedom or do something that the majority of people will not like. It's for the children. Do it for the children. We have to ban sugary drinks 
so children won't be obese. We have to do this so children won't do that. We have to do this so, okay? And so we read from Percy that Dolores Jane Umbridge has been an immediate success, totally revolutionizing the teaching of defense against the dark. Well, that's true. She has revolutionized it. She so revolted it, another form of revolutionized it, that she's an even worse teacher than Lockhart. <laughs> Quirrell wasn't actually so bad. He did at least teach him about, you know, some of the dark critters, kappas and things like that. So the Inquisitor will have powers to inspect her fellow educators and make sure that they are coming up to scratch. So what does that mean? Not only is she now a fully trained educational expert in defense against the dark arts, but she is now a fully trained educational expert in potions, transfiguration, care of magical creatures, astronomy, divination, history of magic, everything. She, as a result of the passing of this one decree, suddenly becomes all knowledgeable. It's what it kind of implies. Okay. And so Mr. Lucius Malfoy is quoted, I feel much easier in my mind now that I know that Dumbledore is being subjected to fair and objective evaluation. Many of us with our children's best interests at heart have been concerned about some of Dumbledore's eccentric decisions in the last few years, such as hiring the werewolf Remus Lupin, half-giant Rubeus Hagrid, and delusional ex-Oror Mad-Eye Moody. Okay. And then there's rumors about, you know, Dumbledore and such. But Wisengamot elders Griselda Marchbanks and Tiberius Ogden have resigned. <clears throat> Madam Marchbanks, Hogwarts is a school, not an outpost of Cornelius Fudge's office. This is a further disgusting attempt to discredit Albus Dumbledore for a full account of Madam Marchbanks' alleged links to subversive goblin groups. So what have they just done to Marchbanks' reputation? They just trashed her. Okay. We're going to meet her later on. We've already seen her once. Book three, when Harry takes the night bus. Okay, Ms. Marchbanks was on the bus that night. Okay, so um, we go on. Let's see here. We're gonna skip a bunch. Harry has more points taken away and, and has detention again. And McGonagall tells him to be careful. So McGonagall gets inspected by Umbridge, pages 320 and 321. And we find out how long McGonagall's been teaching Transfiguration. 39 years. You don't become transfiguration teacher when you're 21. So she's bare minimum 60. She's probably pushing closer to 70. All right. And so Umbridge says, you know, you'll get your evaluations in a while. And then she goes on and evaluates Grumbly Plank, <coughs> Grumbly Plank, sorry. And page 326 and following. Hermione and Ron are talking to Harry. And Hermione says, this is in chapter 15, we're not going to learn any offense against the dark arts. We've got to do something. Harry, well, if you're talking about Lupin, no, 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 I'm not talking about Lupin. Too busy with the order. We can only see him during Hogsmeade weekends. That's not us. Well, Harry, who then? 
Talking about you, Harry. Moment silence. About me what? About you teaching us defense against the dark arts. Harry. What? Ron. That's an idea. What's an idea? You teaching us. But, but I'm not a teacher. Hermione, Harry, you're the best in our year. Why? You beat me in every test. You go, mm, actually, no, I haven't. You beat me in our third year, the only year we both sat the test. Because what happened in Harry's first year? He was in the hospital. Okay. What happened in the second year? Tests were canceled. So, and that was the only year we actually had a test and a teacher who knew the subject. I'm not talking about test re What? Hermione? Not talking about test results? Look what you've done. It's not theory. Tests are theory. Okay? Harry, what do you mean? And Ron's like, you know, I think you're right, Harry. I don't think we want someone this stupid teaching us. <laughs> Let's think, he says. Pulls a face like Goyle. Duh. First year, you saved the stone. But that was luck. That wasn't skill. Second year, you killed the basilisk. Destroyed Riddle. Yeah, but a fox hadn't turned up. Third year, fought off about 100 Dementors. Yeah, well, that was a fluke. Time turner. Last year, fought off you know who again. What has Ron just done? What has he just told Harry? He's told Harry every reason Harry used back on page 167 about why Ron shouldn't be prefect and why Harry should. They weren't there. I. He goes through the list. Now Ron turns the tables. Harry, listen to me. Listen, all right? And now he's angry. Sounds great when you say it like that. But all that stuff was luck. I didn't know what I was doing half the time. I nearly always had help. What is Harry not seeing that Hermione and Ron are seeing? When Harry says he had luck, did he just sit there and wait for luck to come? No. What did he do? He acted. He responded. Even, you know, the first year, they go down through the trap door. They figure out it's Devil Snare. Hermione knows what they need to get rid of Devil Snare. And it takes Harry to say, are you a witch or not? Oh, yeah. You know, and she conjures up fire. We already know fire is one of the things she has a peculiar affinity for. Okay? Don't sit there grinning like you know better than I do. I was there, wasn't. Bingo. <laughs> I know what went on. I didn't get through any of that because I was brilliant at defense against the dark arts. I was got through it all because help came at the right time or because I guessed right. Notice, he's getting really angry. You don't know what it's like. Neither of you. You've never had to face him, have you? Do you think it's just memorizing a bunch of spells? Hermione? Little Miss Know-It-All. Right? What did Hagrid tell Hermione, book two? Spell hasn't been invented that our Hermione doesn't know. Well, we're going to hear about a few. The whole time you're sure you know there's nothing between you and dying except your own, your own, what, brain, guts, whatever? Like you think you can think straight? They don't teach you that in their classes, what it's like to deal things like, like that. In other words... What it's like to deal with what? Real life. And you two sit there acting like I'm a clever little boy. What's Hermione say? Harry, you just said the reason why you should be teaching us. Okay? Don't you see? This is exactly why we need you. We need to know what it's like. You're the only one who can tell us. Other than Dumbledore. And, you know, Lupin and Sirius and a few others. Think about it, okay? Yeah, in a minute. And a 
the scar is prickling again. So we get the next chapter. And Harry's thinking about it. Um, they go off to Hogsmeade. And Harry agrees, and Hermione says, um, we're going to meet at the Hogshead, not the Three Broomsticks. Why the Hogshead? It's quiet. It's quiet. It's out of the way. It's dirty. It's run down. People don't go there. Be a great place to show up. And she tells Harry, well, a few people are going to show up. Page 337. Just a couple. The door opens. First comes Neville with Dean and Lavender, closely followed by Parvati and Padma Patel and Cho, and one of her usually giggling friends. And then Luna Lovegood and Katie Bell and Alicia Spinner and Angelina Johnson and Colin and Dennis Creevy and Ernie McMillan and Justin Finch Fletchley and Hannah Abbott and a puff a puff girl with a long plate whose hair, name Harry doesn't know. Three Ravenclaw boys that he's pretty sure are Anthony Goldstein, Michael Corner, and Terry Boot. Then Ginny, followed by a tall, skinny blonde boy. Okay, who Harry thinks on the Hufflepuff. Quidditch team, but he's not sure of his name. And then bringing up the rear, Fred and George Weasley with their friend, Lee Jordan. So how many people come in? 25! A couple. Plus Harry, Ron, and Hermione. A couple? Well, yeah, the idea was kind of popular. So, Fred and George go get butterbeers for everybody. And Hermione tells them why they're all there, page 339. I, I had the idea it might be good if people who wanted to study again, defense against the dark, you know, I mean, really learn. Not, not, you know, if we took matters into our own hands. Okay. If, if we had a, a real teacher, someone who could properly be trained in defense, because, well, because Lord Voldemort's back. And the reaction's immediate and predictable. Cho's friend shrieked. Terry Boot gave a kind of twitch, you know, Padma shudders, Neville yelps. Okay. And the blonde Hufflepuff player with Ginny. What's the evidence? Dumbledore believes it. You mean Dumbledore believes him. Run. And who are you again? Zachariah Smith. I think we've got the right to know. What makes him say you know who's back? Hermione, well, that's not where Harry's like, no, no, no. You almost get the impression Harry's like, come on, try me. No, no, it's okay. So what makes me say, you know, who's back? I saw him. But Dumbledore told the old school last year, if you didn't believe him, you don't believe me. I'm not going to waste my afternoon trying to convince you. Well, all Dumbledore said was that you saw Diggory get killed. Harry, if you want to come and know what it looks like when Dumbledore murders you, I can't help you. I don't want to talk about Cedric Diggory, all right? So if that's what you're here for, you might as well clear out. Hermione, well, okay. <laughs> it's... Is it true you can produce a Patronus? Yeah. <coughs> a corporeal? Like, Wait a second. I've only heard one other person you know, emphasize that. You don't know Madame Bones, do you? She's my auntie. I'm Susan Bones. She told me about your hearing. So you can make a stag Patronus? Yeah. Lee Jordan. Fred and George's best friend. Blimey, Harry. I never knew that. Mom told Ron not to spread it around. She said you got enough attention as it was. Harry, yeah, not wrong there. Terry Boot, did you kill a basilisk with that sword in Dumbledore's office? Notice, it's what one of the portraits told me. So other people go up to Dumbledore's office because they get in trouble or something, and the portraits, you know, are sitting there going, hey, have you heard about what Harry Potter did? Uh, yeah. Justin Fitch Fletchley whistles. The Creevies, you know, Colin probably pulls out his camera. <laughs> Neville, oh, yeah, and in our first year, he saved, he saved, okay, in the 
British version, it's the phosphorus stone, not the sorceress. Hermione, sorceress. Yeah, that too. Cho. And then he got through the wizard tournament, you know, and lived. And <laughs> Cedric's dead. Harry. Look, I don't want to sound like I'm trying to be modest or anything, but I had a lot of help with that stuff. Michael Corner, not with that dragon, you didn't. In other words, we were all there. That's the only time they were all there. We saw you. It's a seriously cool bit of flying. Notice Harry. Well, okay, go ahead now. Pat myself on the back on that one. Nobody helped you get rid of those Dementors this summer, said Sue. Whoa! How does she know? Shouldn't this have been secret? Okay. Is that correct? Well, okay, so are you trying to weasel out of helping us? Ron, here's an idea. Shut up. Didn't like people using that word weasel because it sounds like weaselly. <laughs> weaselly. Fred and George, you want us to clean out your ears for you? Because, you know, we can do that. George pulls a long, lethal-looking metal instrument from inside one of the Zonko's bags. You just have to wonder what that is, okay? So, Harry agrees, okay? And so they have to come up with ways to meet and such. But they have to juggle it around what? Quidditch practice, homework, because they're in their fifth year, they've got to prepare for their owls. It's hard to find time. Okay. Um, we're going to skip a bunch. Educational degree number 24. All student organizations, societies, teams, groups, etc. are disbanded. Why does this educational degree get decreed? Because there was a spy at the Hogshead that saw this group of 28 students meeting, planning, plotting something. Okay? So what does this mean? It also means no quidditch until the teams get reformed by approval of um, Umbridge. So... Harry gets a message from Sirius, and Sirius says, same time, same place, that he's going to show up in the fireplace. Um, and we see Umbridge go observe Snape's class. Page 363. So how long have you been teaching at Hogwarts? 14 years. How long has Harry been at Hogwarts? How old is Harry? Let me rephrase that. Harry's 15. So, let's see. Snape started at Hogwarts. Let's see. When Harry was just over a year old. Hmm. Okay. And you've applied regularly for the Defense Against the Dark Arts post since you first joined? Yes. And Dumbledore hasn't given it to you? No. And you don't know why? No. Okay, now keep in mind, she's doing this where? In front of all the students. And so it had been thought by everybody, Snape wanted defense against the dark arts, and now it's proven out of his own mouth. All right? So, Trelawney's insulted and all that kind of stuff. We're going to skip a bunch. Uh, and they see Sirius. And Sirius tells them, you know, if you're going to have a secret meeting, go someplace where there's a ton of people, where you won't be noticed as a group. Because how many people does the three broomsticks usually have? It's packed. Okay. But instead, you get 28 students in the hogshead. What kind of people usually go in the hogshead from what we're told? Dragon egg dealers, shady people, in other words. Okay? So, Harry's like, so you don't think it's such a good idea? Seriously, crazy. I think it's an excellent idea. 
even though Mrs. Weasley's against it. Okay. But he's just like, you know, be careful. Okay. So we get Dumbledore's army. Harry needs to find a place for the meeting, and Dobby helps him. So we're going to find the right place. Um, Dobby shows him, and they go into the room of requirement. And what does Harry find? Notice he, he tells Dobby, I need a place, page 386. Where 28 people can practice defensive defense against the dark arts. Okay, so they go to the room, and Harry's outside it, and he's thinking, "I need somewhere to learn to fight, somewhere a place to practice, somewhere they can't find us." Boop, and the door appears, and they go in, and what do they find? Cushions all over, and walls covered with books, with all kinds of against defense against the dark arts books. So, what a great room! And what do we see? Hermione says, well, we need to elect a leader and being the good little busybody teacherist kind of person she is, we need a roster. So everybody has to sign their names. And now they have to come up with a name for their group. Fred, the Ministry of Magic or Morons group? Well, think of the acronym there. M-O-M-A-M-G. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Mam, 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 no. Cho, Defense Association, DA. Ginny, yeah, DA. But no, let's call it Dumbledore's Army, since that's what they're afraid of. Okay, so they do that. And so here, all right, so here's the first test, or the first spell, Expelliarmus. And you just gotta love dear old Zachariah Smith. Well, I don't think Expelliarmus is gonna help anybody. Harry, uh, I used it against Voldemort. Save my bacon. And he shuts up. But if you think it's beneath you, you can leave. And so what do we see? We see people practicing it, and we're told 393, right in the middle. Neville, Expelliarmus. And Harry's wand flies out of his hand. Okay, the first person we see actually do it is Neville. Why? Now, the immediate context is because Carrie kind of has his back turned to him. He's not ready. Okay? So Neville's hitting somebody unarmed, as it were. Okay? What other reason? Just that he has more talent than... Yeah. It, there's actually more than one reason. One is that Neville's got a lot of talent buried deep inside. Two, what's this going to show us about Harry? He's a good teacher. Because we're going to see Neville able to do what by the end? He's going to be able to do a whole bunch of charms. Okay? So, Harry talks to Cho and um, they decide next Wednesday night, etc. And then we get the lion and the serpent, Quidditch match and everything. Luna puts on the lion head. <clears throat> Slytherin sing the Weasley is our king song. And then Hagrid shows up. Okay? Comes back, I should say. After Harry, George, Fred, go after Malfoy, and what happens to him? They get banned from Quidditch. How long do they get banned from Quidditch? For this school year? Lifetime. Lifetime. A lifetime. They can't even go to some old pitch somewhere, some empty field, and have a pickup game of Quidditch. It's like, you know, somehow their brooms won't fly correctly. Okay? So what does this show us about wizarding justice? It's not very fair. It's not very just. So, Hagrid tells them his tale. But what does he not tell them? 
little secret does he keep from them? Grop. That he brought a giant back with him. Okay. And then we get chapter 21. I'm trying to get through this as quickly as possible, and we're still only halfway there. <laughs> the Eye of the Snake. Okay. Umbridge looks at, uh, evaluates Hagrid. Snake, um, what's his name? Weasley says some, not Weasley. Malfoy says some things. Okay. Um, and Harry talks about kissing Cho, and Cho bursts into tears. And on 4.59, Hermione has to explain to Harry and Ron what Cho is feeling. And Ron says it's impossible for anyone to feel all that. And Hermione says, just because you've got the emotional range of a teaspoon doesn't mean we all have. Okay? Um, and then Harry has a dream, page 462. And he wakes up screaming. And he tells Ron his father's been attacked. And they get McGonagall and they get Dumbledore. And Dumbledore, Dumbledore asks Harry, page 468, how did you see this? Harry, uh, inside my head. No, no, no. Dumbledore says, where were you? What was your position? I was the snake. I, I, I saw it from the snake's point of view. Is Arthur seriously wizard? Uh, seriously injured? Yes. <laughs> Blood all down his front. So Dumbledore immediately springs into action. Talks to the portraits. He gives them jobs. He creates a port key. Okay. He tells McGonagall to get the other, you know, kids and such. Okay. And pay, I'm skipping a bunch again. On page 474, he says, I'm sending you to uh, the headquarters. And just before they touch the port key, <coughs> Harry and Dumbledore look at each other. It happened in a fraction of a second. In the infinitesimal pause before Dumbledore said three, Harry looked up at him. They were very close together, and Dumbledore's clear blue gaze moved from the port key to Harry's face. Harry's scar burned white hot, and he wants to attack. And then, bip, he's gone. Okay? So they go off to number 12, Grimmauld Place, and they receive word Arthur's still alive. And taken to St. Mungo's. And so they essentially now just have to wait. They don't know what's happened. They don't know why it's happened. Okay. Taunts is there. Others are all there. And they go to St. Mungo's. And we get a little interesting, you know, visit, or, or not visit, uh, introduction to, you know, the kinds of magical maladies that there are. Artifact accidents, creature-induced injuries on the bottom of 485, magical bugs, potion and plant poisoning. Okay. And they make their way up. They see Mr. Weasley. Fred and George are using their extendable ears. And what do we hear? Page 491. Of course Dumbledore's worried says Mad-Eye. The boy seeing things from inside you know who's snake. Obviously, Potter doesn't realize what that means, but if you know who's possessing him. And Harry's like, oh great, I'm possessed by Voldemort. Okay. They go back home, and what does Harry do? Locks himself in his room. Starts to pack his stuff. And Phineas Nigellus, oh, gonna run away, are you? Harry, I'm not saving my neck. Oh, I see. You're doing the noble thing. Because you're a Gryffindor, after all. I have a message for you from Dumbledore. Well, what is it? Page 495. Stay where you are. I haven't moved. What's the message? Hello? Stupid. 
stay where you are. Well, what else? Nothing. That's it? Just nothing? Just stay here? Phineas Nigellus. You know, this is precisely why I hated being a teacher. Young people are so infernally convinced that they're absolutely right about everything, especially 15, 16, 17-year-olds, you know. Has it not occurred to you, my poor puffed-up Popinjay, that there might be an excellent reason why the headmaster of Hogwarts is not confiding every tiny detail of his plans to you? Okay, keep in mind who he's talking about. Dumbledore. What have we been told about Dumbledore? He's the only person Voldemort ever was afraid of. He's the guy who gets owls from the Ministry of Magic, plaguing him with questions. And he's saying, and you want him to deal with every little problem you have? You want him to share every idea he has? Have you never paused while feeling hard done by to note that following Dumbledore's orders has never yet led you into harm? This is an important little bit of foreshadowing for book seven. Because what is Phineas Nigellus really telling Harry? Trust Dumbledore. Trust him implicitly. Trust him blindly. Okay? No, no. Like all young people, you're quite sure that you alone feel and think. You alone recognize danger. You're the only one clever enough to realize what the Dark Lord may be planning. Okay? So Phineas Nigellus leaves. And Harry stays away from everybody else. Hides in his room. Until finally, Harry, uh, Ron, Fred, George, Ginny come in. And Ginny's like, um, Harry, we know what's going on. You think you're possessed. Well, you know someone who's been possessed, right? Harry's like, huh? Do I? Uh, hello? So she asks him, big blocks of time, you can't remember anything? No. Blank memories? No. Then you haven't been possessed. Okay? She tells him, bottom of... 499, top of 500. Harry, I forgot. <laughs> Lucky you. Notice, Jenny hasn't forgotten what it's like to be possessed. Harry, I'm sorry. So do you think I'm being possessed? No. <laughs> so everything at that point all becomes happy. For Harry, at least. So, they go around, they look for Creature. And Creature's not there. Well, why isn't Creature there? Because when they first arrived, they heard Sirius say, Get out! Get out! And Creature took Sirius seriously. Okay? Harry asks, bottom of 504, he couldn't have left, could he? I mean, when you said get out, maybe he thought you meant out of the house? Sirius, no, no, no. House elves can't leave unless they're given clothes. Not quite true. Okay. So they go back to St. Mungo's. And who do they run into? Gilderoy Lockhart, who's learned joined up writing. He can now write cursive. And he can write cursive on what? Scraps of paper and photographs of himself. Okay. Well, what else do they see on that floor? Okay, they go to floor spell damage. They see Lockhart. And page 511. Uh, I think it's 511. We've seen a real improvement in Mr. Bode. Broderick. Bode? Hello. <laughs> um, and they talk about Broderick Bode a bit, some things that have happened to him. 
And then on page 512, oh, hello, Mrs. Longbottom, are you leaving already? Harry's head spins around. He thinks Neville. He thinks can't let Ron and Hermione know about Neville. He tries to get them out. Ron, Neville! It's us, Neville! Friends of yours, Neville, dear. Neville, yes. And she says, oh, I know who you are, of course. <laughs> You're Harry Potter. Neville speaks most highly of you. Oh, thanks. And you two are clearly Weasleys. She looks at Ron and Jenny. Yes, yes, I know your parents. Not well, of course, but fine people, fine people. And you must be Hermione. In other words, Neville talks about all of them. Neville's told me about all of you. He's a good boy. Hasn't got his father's talent, you know, but what does that one line tell us? She's not the nicest person. What else? She's degrading. She's degrading. He's a disappointment. He doesn't match up to her ideal. He's not as good as his father. He's not as good as his father. So what does that mean for Neville? Not as much hope. Is it neglect? Neville thinks, I'll, I'll never be good enough. So what happens if you think you'll never be good enough? You don't try. <laughs> you don't try. And if you do, you don't succeed. What must you have to succeed? You've got to have faith in yourself. Okay? Ron, is that your dad? Alexis? Haven't you told your friends about your parents, Neville? It's nothing to be ashamed of. You should be proud. Proud, Neville, proud. They didn't give their health and sanity, so their only son would be ashamed of them. Neville, I'm not ashamed. Well, you've got a funny way of showing it. And so he tell, she tells them, my son and his wife, tortured by the others, by the Death Eaters, highly gifted, the pair of them. Yes, Alice, dear. And Neville's mother comes wandering down the aisle. And she does what? Again? Very well, Alice dear. Very well. Neville, take it, whatever it is. And his mother dropped an empty Drubal's blowing gum wrapper into his hand. Very nice, dear. She pats his mother on the shoulder and go back. Neville, thanks, Mom. And his mom tots back. Very nice to have met you all. Put that wrapper in the bin, Neville. She must have given you enough of them to paper your bedroom by now. Okay? So his mother comes shuffling down in her little slippers and nightdress. And she hands Neville what? A piece of gum wrapper. Trash. According to Neville's grandmother. And his grandmother says, she must have given you how many of these? Enough to wallpaper your bedroom with them. This tells us what? Tells us a, a few things. One, it tells us how often Neville visits. Two, it tells us what happens every visit. His mother gives him something. Okay. What does Neville do with the piece of paper? Why? It's from his mom. And I love the tone of voice she used. <laughs> it's from his mother. What time of year is it? Christmas. It's Christmas. This is his mother's Christmas present to him. And how does Neville treat it? Yeah. Like it's the most valuable thing in the world. What we see here is an act of interpretation on a Neville's part to a piece of trash. Okay? We're going to see in book seven an act of interpretation by Harry of words uttered by Dudley. Dudley is going to say, I don't think you're a waste of space. And Petunia's going to get all slobbery and, you know, stuff. She goes, oh, Dudley, you know, what a beautiful boy, you know. And she's an apology or something. And Hestia Jones is going to say, what? That wasn't 
in air, he's like, no, 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 you don't understand. For Dudley to say I'm not a waste of space, that's like saying I love you. Harry takes Dudley saying you're not a waste of space as I love you. Harry interprets what Dudley, what Dudley meant the same way, okay, Neville interprets this. And that's the reason why he keeps every, here we go, every one of those pieces of paper. So you can imagine, if you go to the, Neville's home, he's got a stack of these somewhere. Okay? Why? Because it shows his mother is still there. There's something upstairs that gives him that connection. This is why Harry really is worse off than Dudley. Dudley at least gets something every year from his mother. Sorry, Neville. Neville gets something every year, every visit from his mother. What does Harry get? No, no, don't kill Harry. No. That's it. He doesn't hear, oh, Harry, my beautiful boy, my wonderful boy. Now he can replay, you know, hold on, Harry. <laughs> Your father will solve everything for you. Okay? So they leave. And Hermione says, I never knew. Ron, nor did I. Ginny, nor me. Harry, I did. <laughs> Didn't tell you. Dumbledore told me not to. That's what Bellatrix Lestrange got sent to Azkaban for. Hermione. Finally, the lights start to shine. Bellatrix Lestrange, the woman Creature's got a photo of in his little den, his little bedroom. Harry. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe Creature isn't all that wonderful after all. Because after all, what does Hermione think about Creature? Oh, it's just misunderstood. If you'd really get to know him, then he'd turn. No, he wouldn't. Not yet. It's not getting to know creature. It's doing what to creature that gets creature to turn. Okay. Isn't Hermione being kind to creature? She doesn't call him filthy little death eater loving she treats him nicely. Those are acts of kindness. What else is it? It's the locket. It's giving him something of his masters that brings creature around. Okay? So we have the chapter Occlumency, where Harry finds out he's got to take another class from Snape. And Snape comes up with the good idea, a little bit later, of... Um, we can't tell everybody you're taking Occlumency, so we need to come up with a cover. What is it? Remedial potions. You're so bad at potions that you need remedial potions. Okay? So how do we see... Um, Sirius and Snape act towards each other. Exactly as you would expect, Sirius and Snape. Okay? So before Harry goes off to school, what does Sirius give him? The mirror. The mirror. Which should be used for what? Two minutes to talk to Sirius. To communicate with me should you ever need to. And what does Harry think? Hell no. If I ever pull out that mirror and say, Sirius, X, Y, or Z is going on, what is Sirius going to do? Come to the rescue. And what will happen if Sirius comes to the rescue and dies? It's my fault. Harry still hasn't learned the lesson Dumbledore tried to teach in book two. Okay? It takes all the way through book seven for it to finally sink in. 
So Harry goes off to class with Snape, Occlumency, and Snape says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try and pierce your mind. I want you to, you know, try to repel me. Harry's like, how? We'll just try. <laughs> you have to imagine Snape is taking a certain amount of kind of sick pleasure in this. So Snape pulls out his wand, tells Harry to stand, and what happens? Page 534. Snape sees Harry was five, watching Dudley riding a red, new red bicycle, heart bursting with jealousy. He was nine, Ripper the Bulldog, chasing him up a tree. Dursley's laughing. He's sitting under the sorting hat. It was telling him he'd do well in Slytherin. Hermione lying in the hospital wing, her face covered with black fur, hair. A hundred Dementors closing in. Cho! Drawing nearer to him under the mistletoe. Hey! <laughs> Draw the line there. Okay. Snape, did you mean to produce a stinging hex? No. Well, you let me get in too far. What did you do? You lost control. <laughs> Harry, did you see everything? Flashes. To whom did the dog belong? My Aunt Marge. Snape, well, it wasn't bad. Say, so, so what effect do you think, if any, Snape's seeing these memories has on Snape? What does he see of Harry's childhood? <laughs> it's a little Sever Snape. What, what's the big difference? He doesn't see Harry cowering in a corner as his father is yelling at his mother, which is an image we will see later. Okay. So he tells Harry, clear your mind. Let go of all emotion. Harry, how? How do you do that? You're not doing it, Potter. You'll need more discipline. What does he see now? The dragon, his father and mother coming out of looking out of the mirror. Cedric Diggory. No. Okay. So what does Snape tell him? When he tell, tells Harry, empty yourself of emotion. Harry, I'm having trouble with that. Page 536. Then you will find yourself easy prey for the Dark Lord. Fools who wear their hearts proudly on their sleeves, who cannot control their emotions who wallow in sad memories and allow themselves to be provoked this easily, weak people, in other words, they stand no chance against his powers. Harry, I'm not weak. Then prove it. How do you prove it? Master yourself. Okay. As I said at the beginning of this book, the lesson Harry must learn is self-control. Okay? Control your anger. Discipline your mind. Snape goes in, and now what happens? Harry knows what the door is that he's been seeing in his dreams. What's in the Department of Mysteries? What? What's in the Department of Mysteries, sir? Nothing for you to know. Well, I know Voldemort wants something. I told you, don't say the Dark Lord's name. Well, but there's... So he tells Harry, practice. And Harry doesn't practice very well. Okay, Page 541, Harry has a vision, and he knows something has happened that has made Voldemort really happy. But he doesn't know what. So we get 543, the beetle at bay. And what do we hear? There's a mass breakout from Azkaban. Right? whole bunch of people. What else do we hear? Tragic demise of a Ministry of Magic worker, Broderick Bode, dead in his bed. Okay. Hermione says, wait, we saw him. Christmas. That was Devil's Snare. Hmm, that's interesting. So we're going to skip a bunch. And we find out, page 551, there's a new order above the High Inquisitor. 
Teachers are banned from giving students any information not strictly related to the subjects they're paid to teach. Okay, now think about that for a moment. Read that literally. So, what does that mean the teachers can only speak to their students about? Their classes. That's it. They can't speak to their students about anything else. They can't tell their students anything about umbrage. They can't help them with any other problems. Okay? This little decree will come back to bite umbrage. Okay? Page 554-55. <coughs> Harry's talking about his occlumency lessons with Hermione and Ron. And he's like, you know, I'm having problems. But I now understand what my dreams are somewhat. And Hermione's like, Harry, you really need to stop having this. Dumbledore wants you to practice occlumency. And Harry's like, yeah, but Snape's not really helping me. And Ron's like, well, you know, it's because Snape's bad. He's a Death Eater. Hermione, Dumbledore trusts him. If we can't trust Dumbledore, we can't trust anyone. Okay? So... Um, Harry goes off for his little date with Hermione, uh, sorry, with Cho. And then he asks Cho, do you mind if we meet up with Hermione? And she's like, hmm, threesome. Not really what I had intended. She gets all upset. Um, and they run into Rita Skeeter, because Hermione has planned this, at the three broomsticks. And what does Hermione plan with Rita Skeeter? Rita's going to tell Harry's side of the story. In other words, Rita's going to actually write a true article. An article based on fact. She's not going to write a bunch of rumor and hearsay. Okay? Why is Rita going to do this? She's because Hermione's blackmailing her. You know, so much for the goody two shoes. And when that comes out, uh, I'm going to skip a bunch here. When that comes out, page 579, what happens? Okay, the Quibbler publishes it. Give me a real world example of the Quibbler. National Enquirer, The Star, you know, things like that, okay? So Umbridge obviously immediately bans anybody from owning the Quibbler, which, which means everyone has it. I mean, you know, some filmmaker comes out with a movie bashing Christianity. Christians go out and they harangue and they protest against the movie, and what happens? Sales go up. Okay, people will now want to see what the big problem is. So people start reading the Quibbler, and what happens? They believe it. They believe what Rita Skeeter says. Why? Because it's not outlandish. It doesn't sound so far out of the realm of the possible. So that even Seamus Finnegan comes up and says, you know, Sorry, Harry. Other people come up. Now keep in mind, what gets said in the article? Not only is Voldemort back, not only is, you know, Cedric's death described, but what else? Oh well, yeah, here are some of the Death Eaters. Malfoy, Crab, Goyle, uh, Goyle Avery, Not, you know, all these others. Bellatrix Lestrange, you know, that are out. Harry has another dream. Okay. He sees Avery get tortured. Poor Avery. He got tortured in book four, too. The guy just can't do anything right. Okay. So Harry goes off, now we're out of time, to Snape's again for another occlumency lesson. And we will pick up when we come back, on page 591. And we've got to finish 
on Tuesday.